Okay. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Dakshan Ganeshan and I'm the president of the RRA. On behalf of the entire RRA executive committee, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this roundtable session. As you may all know, RRA is an affinity group within the AUR and our primary mission is to promote research and in interdisciplinary research in radiology and radiological sciences. Uh, we have multiple initiatives which runs throughout the year in tandem. We have numerous task forces which are focused on key topics. And usually we present the findings of task forces during the AUR annual meeting. I also present uh, the work of the task force as a white paper to the Journal of Academic Radiology. Uh, we also have multiple research work groups uh, focused on vital topics relevant to radiology, including 3D printing, artificial intelligence, and research mentoring. So today it gives me great pleasure in welcoming you all to this inaugural roundtable session by RA on the topic of virtual mentoring and research. The moderators for the session is going to be Dr. Omar Awan and Dr. Ben Spilseth, and these are the chairs of our RA research mentoring work group. We have a wonderful panel, and like everyone else, I'm also eager looking forward to the session. Over to you, Ben Omar. Thanks. Um, so I'm involved uh, here as the RRA treasurer and the former chair of the uh, Research Mentoring Working Group. And uh, I just wanted to talk a bit about what the RRA Research Mentoring Working Group is and what we've been doing. Um, the purpose of this group is to really facilitate mentoring for academic radiologists with a research-oriented bent, um, but we want it to be a holistic and inclusive um, um, program. And so um, we're really looking to connect people from across the country um, with mentors and mentees. And I've been involved for about two and a half years and have organized the um, uh, virtual research mentoring work um, program that was started a few years back and handed down to me by uh, Dr. Andrew Rosencraft. And um, for this, what we've been doing is um, soliciting volunteers to serve as mentors or mentees, and then doing our best to pair people with um, like-minded researchers that share the same kind of ideas or goals or um, interests. And we've been fairly successful over the past few years. We had over 35 people particip participating last year. And um, we're doing it again this year. And we wanna just make sure that everyone um, attending has an opportunity to um, try to try to join that. If you haven't done it in the past, you can reach out to Dr. Awan or myself, and we can get you connected either this year or if you or if you miss out on this year's um, mentoring group, you can do it in the future. Additionally, we've been doing programs um, or been trying to find other venues to talk about research mentoring, and we've done an in-person session at an AUR um, two years ago and. Last year, we had a similar session planned. However, it was canceled because of uh, the COVID. And so um, we've, we're having our inaugural virtual um, research mentoring panel, which is what we're doing today. And uh, Dr. Awan is our current um, chair of the research mentoring working group. And he's done a lot to organize this and put this together. So I'm gonna turn it over to him um, for this round table event and he'll um, introduce our panelists. Thank you so much, Ben, and thank you, Duction. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here to, to help moderate this session along with Ben. I just want to introduce our, before we you know, field questions from the audience, I want to just introduce our all-star panel panelists. We have four all-star panelists, and they really are all-stars, and they're leaders and visionaries in our field, and I'm just so thrilled that they're here to to, to share their wealth of knowledge with all of us. So, you know, and I could literally talk all hour about all of their accomplishments, to be frank with you, but I'm gonna keep it very brief uh, just for everyone's sake so we can get this going. So our first panelist is Dr. Etta Pisano, and she currently serves as the Vice Chair of Research in the Department of Radiology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Harvard Medical School. She also serves as a Senior Director for Research Development at the Center for Research and Innovation at the ACR since July of 2015. She's won gold medals at literally all of our societies. Um, so AUR in 2010, ARS in 2012, RSNA in uh, 2012 as well. And I could go on and on, but uh, well, welcome Dr. Bassano. We're thrilled that you're here. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Steven Seltzer. He's another legend in our field. He's the chair emeritus at the Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School. He's now the distinguished cook professor there at the Harvard Medical School. He served as chairman at, at Brigham and Women's Hospital from 1997 to 2016 for, uh, for about 20 years. He also has uh, multiple gold medal awards. Um, 
from the AUR back in uh, 2004 and then the RSA in 2015. Um, so welcome, Dr. Seltzer. It's, it's an honor to have you here as well. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Elizabeth Krupinski, who again is a major, major leader in our field. She currently is on the RRA board as well. She serves, she's a professor and the vice chair of research at Emory University uh, in the Department of Radiology and Imag Imaging Sciences, Psychology and Medical Informatics. Um, she, her interests are in medical imaging per perception, observer performance, medical decision-making and human factors. Uh, she recently uh, received the RSNA um, Outstanding Research Award. Um, so welcome, Dr. Kupinski. It's great to have you here. And, and, and last, but certainly, certainly not least, we have uh, Dr. Gary Whitman here. Um, again, he's a tenured professor of breast imaging and radiation oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, where he currently serves as the medical director of the mobile mammography program and the lead interpreting physician of the mammography program. Um, he's currently the vice president of the American Rank and Race Society he has served as a past president to our organization, um, AUR, as well as research interests include staging breast cancer with ultrasound, high risk breast lesions and unusual breast lesions. So you can see we have truly a remarkable and expert, expert panel of mentors. And I hope, I mean, I'm, I'm ready to learn and I hope that everyone here is ready to learn from their expertise. So um, I think the way this is gonna work is we will have, you know, people, there's an open Q and A box where you can post your questions. So Ben and I will be kind of fielding the questions as they go along. You can feel free to post your questions there. You can also raise your hand and you know one of the, either Amanda or one of the RSNA staff will, will unmute you and then you can verbally ask your question. So um, without further ado, I wanna open it up for anyone to ask any questions that they have um, to, our, to our panel. So they can, and anything about mentorship, the mentor-mentee relationship, whatever you guys wanna ask, please, feel free to do so. And don't be shy, you can, you can unmute your mics, you can type in the Q&A answer session. So I think uh, they're, they're letting you talk now. I think your talking is now permitted. Does anyone have a question that they wanna ask? We ha I have tons of questions that I can ask. I've prepared, Ben and I have prepared tons of questions. So we want to give you guys the opportunity to ask the questions first. Okay. All right. So well, I'm going to ask the first question actually, and then maybe that'll, that'll help get the ball rolling and get the juices rolling. So this is a general question for anyone in the panel. Um, how does a mentee go about picking a mentor? Because oftentimes it can be very difficult for uh, sometimes, you know, we, we, we have experts in our field in every department, you know, sometimes it can be intimidating to potentially approach a, a mentor, how does, how does a mentee, when they're ready to do something, either research or, you know, for a promotion, how does one, how does a mentee go about choosing the right mentor for them? Well, I'll start out. I mean, there, there, there's a lot of ways. And, and one is trying to figure out what you want that mentor for. Um, people can have multiple mentors uh, that cover different aspects of their career. So, you know, if you want a research mentor, that's potentially very different from someone who's going to mentor you in clinical skills or something along those lines. So one, like I said, is figure out what area you want that mentor in. Um, second, you might want to ask around, you know, other folks in the department, especially at your level, and those who are like right above you, a couple years out uh, above you, and ask, you know, what's with this person? Are they good? Are they bad? You know, can they dedicate the time? And then ask the, uh, your department chair sometimes or, or your vice chair of research or your vice chair of clinical affairs, depending again on sort of the area that you're interested in getting that mentoring on, get their opinion as, as to that person. Uh, and then finally, you just approach the person, uh, you know, and you can ask them straight out. I mean, I would rather be asked straight out, do you have time and interest in taking on a mentee? Um, and, you know, Sometimes they answer yes, and sometimes you know it's like I'm just too slammed right now. Um, but come back to me in six months. Hopefully, none of them will say no. Don't want to do that. But every now and then they do. So that that's kind of what I would say. Thank You're you. Muted, I would add. I would add that um, you shouldn't be embarrassed or inhibited from talking about mentorship to people, um, both your peers and the people up the chain, you know, that you're hoping to get as mentors, 
first off, you don't have to be very far up the chain to be a mentor. <laughs> you could be a peer, really. People the same, you know, in your class, uh, they may know more about a topic and be able to help you. So I, I think the key is to have a very low rate of inhibition of asking people for help in general. <laughs> So I would encourage you not to feel embarrassed or inhibited. Um, it, the worst thing that can happen is they say, I don't have time or I, I can't do it. I mean, so that's not a really bad. Uh, Omar, if I could, I could build on what Elizabeth and mm -hmm. what were saying. Uh, uh, I, I, obviously, you know, the, the best possible way to do it is for uh, a, a mentee to have the uh, self-confidence and uh, uh, feel the availability of mem members of the radiology faculty or, you know, in 2020, uh, any faculty member in any department uh, to ask them to uh, help in their professional development. Uh, we do understand uh, that the, the barrier for a trainee to approach a faculty member, uh, a, a mid-career or senior faculty member is pretty huge. And uh, so a variation on the theme that Elizabeth and Etta uh, talked about is uh, trying to uh, envision a handshake uh, between the faculty and the trainees and say, uh, we, we, everyone needs a mentor. Uh, it, it, even us older folks need <laughs> mentoring for all sorts of things. So uh, it, if you have someone in mind, pick them and we'll help you find a uh, risk-free way to approach them. Uh, if, if you don't know, if, if you're new to our organization, you just don't know the people, uh, we'll, we'll provide you with someone uh, because uh, we know everyone needs it. It may not be a perfect fit. We'll do the best we can uh, and see how it goes. And uh, at least it gets you into the system. Uh, so uh, one of, you know, uh, the, a key obstacle to overcome is, is to get people talking. Uh, and Elizabeth and Ed are exact, exactly right. Uh, there's so many people are willing to do this kind of work, uh, but it's, uh, uh, you know, if you're a first year or second year radiology resident, it, it, it's tough to approach a senior faculty member uh, with all those questions. So. Uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's a shared responsibility uh, between the department and the trainees or, young, or younger faculty <clears throat> to try to make sure that those conversations happen. So I, I think that's, maybe that's helpful. But maybe this makes it a little less hard. I have never had anyone in, in the field of radiology from any institution tell me they wouldn't help me. <laughs> when I asked them for help. Okay. And that includes when I was a junior person, very, very junior. I mean, it, that's why I say the worst thing that can happen is they, what Elizabeth said, you know, they might say, come back in six months. People usually are very open to helping. And, right. you know, so I just think, get over your inhibitions and ask advice about who to ask to, and we'll help you with the A, you know, the RRA can help you get connected to people. That's the nice thing about the AUR, in my opinion, is how sure. much we interface with each other at the meeting. It will come back someday. We won't always be virtual. <laughs> and then you can meet people face to face. But even when it's not, when it's virtual, we can introduce you to people. Yeah, a very good point. Uh, 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 to paraphrase you, uh, 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 le le leverage our network here uh, that you're part of, if you're part of RRA. Uh, Thank you, you so know. much. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, one of the big advantages of radiology is just how reasonable and down to earth all the radiologists you meet are. And so, it should be easy for everyone to connect with a mentor. So I'm gonna to go to the next question, which is coming from someone, uh, one of our um, guests here. It says, if you get mentored from someone outside of your institution, how often would be good to meet? And maybe Dr. Whitman, if you wanted to try to answer that. So this is from, from how, how often to meet. And um, if there's somebody from outside of your institution, I think a lot of it will depend on the project itself, uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, for example, uh, also the, uh, the level of skill of the mentee and the mentor. Um, maybe, maybe you may have to reach out to a third person for a certain skill. So there, there's no real cookbook, but you have to sort of go by feel. And sometimes I'll just ask the person, um, like right now is October 13th. I'll say, well, would you like to meet in early November? 
And uh, they say, yeah. And then usually I'll just try to follow up and get, get something on my calendar and their calendar so that at least you can keep the ball rolling. But I, I don't think there's a real game plan, so to speak. A lot of it just has to be um, what's comfortable for, uh, for both parties and what will allow the objectives to be met. And if it is a more of a researchy type mentorship and you're working, like said, Gary said, on a specific project, quite often it's, it's like more intense in the beginning and then it scales down. Um, so you might want to schedule, you know, every other week in the beginning, if it's necessary, just to get on board, figure out, you know, what to do and so on. And then after that, you know, monthly or, or even quarterly, it just depends on sort of what's needed. I agree with everything that was said. I, I would also add that it's really up to the, the person being mentored to sort of drive the relationship. I always tell people when they ask me explicitly to be their mentor that, you know, I don't know what you need, <laughs> so you do. And so um, if you need a, you know, something acutely, you know, very easily accessible, just let me know and I will be available for you. And if, if it's, you know, we can put it on, if it needs to be put on the back burner for a few months, that's fine too. So I think being open about what your needs are and explaining what you need and the person can suggest what they think is appropriate. But after it started as a relationship, it's really good for the person who is being mentored to drive the frequency of meetings. Thank you so much for those insights. Those are wonderful. I wanna move on to the next question. It's coming from uh, Dr. Susan Hobbs, who asked, this is an interesting question. Uh, I'd be curious to see what the panel thinks about this. Do any of you have a mentoring contract or have you used such a contract with the mentor-mentee relationship? I have, but it was in the context of an institutional mentoring program uh, where that was actually part of the, the process and everything. Uh, when people have approached me and so on, I've never used anything that formal. I've used one also in the exact same thing um, when it was a more formal program that, where someone was assigned, I was assigned to someone and, th and there were expectations of the relationship. But I would say, it's not really needed in most mentoring relationships. Um, if it's not working out for you, you know, you're going to know <laughs> and you should find somebody else. I mean, I don't think having a contract will make people make it work out. I think the, just the relationship you develop, the warmth of the relationship, the personal connection, that's what assures something that will work or not. And if it's not working, you know, having a contract doesn't help really. Yeah. I never had, I've never been involved with a contract. <clears throat> But I will say that I try to keep my eye on things. If if progress is stalling or maybe not at the rate that we want it to go, I'll sometimes ask the person, "Would you would you like that, some help on this, or would you like us to bring on another person?" I try to articulate that earlier rather than later. I don't want it to be at the end of June and the fellow's done very little on the project and then they're, they're just stuck in the mud. So I'm I'm trying to think a little bit ahead for them. Um, so it's not really a contract, but I'm trying to to look out to move the project along and hopefully help their progress as well. And, and uh, Susan, just a, a slight variation on the theme. I, I agree with what everyone has said. Uh, uh, in, in our organization, uh, we, we tend to avoid using the term contract and we prefer the word compact, that there's a shared understanding of uh, what the mentor and the mentee are going to contribute to the relationship. Uh, it's it's not uh, not a legal obligation, uh, and it's uh, relatively informal. But uh, at the beginning of the relationship, to uh, have a shared understanding with uh, an important person in, in your professional life, uh, at, as if it were a compact, you know, you you'll do this, I'll do this, uh, is uh, a good idea, and, and it can. Uh, uh, facilitate a strong relationship and also uh, prevent uh, disappointments or misunderstandings uh, later on. Like, you know, you said you would meet with me every 10 minutes uh, and uh, wait a minute, wait, no, that, that's not what I agreed to. Uh, so uh, uh, having a conversation around uh, mutual expectations is absolutely a good thing. I don't think it has to be reduced to writing uh, but uh, at least a, a shared understanding is uh, uh, g generally what's necessary. Great, thanks. That, that's, that's very helpful. Um, another uh, question from an attendee here from Dr. Nassim. Um, 
The RRA encourages linking mentors often from quite far away. Um, there are additional, additional challenges for these distance mentoring relationships compared to someone you're physically closer to. Um, so can, do you have anything to add to that? Um, maybe Dr. Krapinski and um, <clears throat> You know, how do you overcome the, the challenges of the distance relationship when you yeah, can't? Yeah, well, we've all figured out how to Zoom. Um, so yeah. I think that's one of the first steps. We're, we're all getting used to this sort of remote, uh, you know, meeting and stuff. I think the main challenge is, again, it depends on the type of mentoring. If it is a research mentoring, um, you know, distance, it's hard to get into the lab with somebody. Um, so if you're actually having, you know, that kind of a problem where, where it's a, a more technical problem or you know, a procedural type thing, that, that's when it gets difficult. I honestly think that the, the, the majority of what needs to be done can really be done one-on-one. -on -one. What, what it's missing is sort of, you know, I mean, a lot of mentoring doesn't have to take place at work. I mean, you know, you know let's go get a cup of coffee. And it just creates a different connection, I think, when you can do something like that as opposed to, okay, let's Zoom. And yeah, you can establish a relationship and especially if you know you met before and so on, but you sort of miss that, you know, intimacy is the wrong word, but I, it's that connection that you can establish where only let's relax, have a cup of coffee, you know, and, and just chat. There's not as much chatting via Zoom as, as you would in person, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, ben and, and uh, Ichiro, if I, I could uh, contribute something also. Uh, uh, we have a successful model for uh, external mentoring uh, that I've, I've had the privilege of being involved with for many years and a number of our panelists have been part of this program, uh, which is the uh, AURGE Radiology uh, research Academic Fellowship Program, or, or we call it GRAF, uh, just for fun. And uh, one of the uh, mentoring uh, principles in that program is that it is so much better to have both a, a local and a national mentor uh, for all the reasons that Elizabeth already addressed. Uh, when One needs to have somebody nearby that you can have coffee with drop in, uh, uh, ha have a uh, compact uh, with that, you know, you'll do this, they'll do that. Uh, uh, a, a mentor at a distance uh, is fabulous and, and it adds value uh, to the relationships. It's not as operationally functional as someone having someone right there. Uh, so in the GRAF program, uh, there, there's a, there are both local mentors and national mentors. And, uh, you know, from my humble opinion, that, that, that's a good combination. Uh, uh, having the two is, you know, uh, uh, more, more than double the value. Uh, but having only a, 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 a national mentor, or unless it's someone that, you know, obviously, that, you already know or is working in exactly the same field as you are, that could be different. But uh, on general principles, uh, ha having both is fabulous. Uh, and uh, just to, sorry to pile on, but uh, in the uh, developing uh, uh, field of what is optimal mentoring, uh, every article I read from all the scholars in this uh, area, uh, say, hey, basically the more the merrier. Uh, you need a local mentor, you need, you need a non-local mentor, you need a mentor about your academic development, you need a mentor about your personal happiness, you need a psychotherapist, you know, uh, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, I'm not sure all that's feasible, but uh, at least the conventional wisdom these days is uh, one needs mentors in every aspect of your personal and professional life. Uh, and they change as, as you, one becomes more mature, uh, but you always need them. So uh, uh, don't, don't be shy about uh, uh, developing a uh, cadre of mentors, some, some of whom are local and some of whom are not, and some of whom are in radiology and some of whom are not. Uh, the, the more the better. Uh, there, there's, there's no downside uh, to 
reaching out to people and and uh, they can always be uh, a, a resource and, and be helpful to you. Great, thank you so much. As a follow-up, I think a nice follow-up question to that, um, kind of tackling that in a sort of a different angle. What are some of the barriers that don't allow a mentor-mentee relationship to flourish? What are some of the things um, that may go wrong um, in a mentor-mentee relationship that don't allow proper mentorship to occur? In lack of investment. I mean, on either part, you know, not taking it seriously and not, not you know, whether it's a compact contract or just a handshake, not meeting the expectations of, of what you started out with. I think that's one of the main ones. Yeah, I would add, um, it really comes down to personality fit. I've noticed, um, you know, in my own mentoring relationships, both as a mentee or protege and as a mentor, um, you know, it really has to do with whether you like each other <laughs> a little bit and, and, you know, your personalities kind of mesh together. I think there's a lot of chemistry to mentoring, you know, and, and um, you know, there are and I think sometimes your chemistry just isn't good as with any relationship. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, you should find somebody else. I mean, I, you know, I think, um, you know, I think it's the kind of thing that you just know when you're in a relationship that's not working. Um, you know, hopefully the mentors candid with you if they feel that way, but um, you can tell as the person who's being mentored, if the other person really isn't invested in you and isn't really making the time for you. So I just, I don't really have any special advice about that. It's really just to pay attention to whether it feels right to you. you know, I, I think sometimes beyond chemistry, it can just sometimes the work styles are very different. Um, or sometimes people like to do the whole thing in five days where I may tell the person, well, I just want you to write the methods and then come back in a week. And they come back with a gobbledygook manuscript that I can't make heads or tails out of. And then you have to untangle it again. Just sometimes you're just so incompatible in the way you approach a problem that it's not going to work out. Now, on the other hand, I think sometimes get, getting a mentor from somebody who looks, looks at life a little bit differently can help open your horizon a little bit. So there, there are pros and cons in that. Omar, uh, let me add also at, at uh, you know, kind of a meta level here, uh, again, agreeing with what uh, all has been said. Uh, uh, one of the issues that, that I've observed and has concerned me uh, over the last recent years is uh, what's the organizational culture about mentoring? Uh, uh, I mean, we, we, everyone on this call would, would agree about how uh, valuable uh, mentoring is uh, to both the mentor and the mentee. Uh, in 2020, uh, the incentives in academic radiology, uh, sadly, my humble opinion, uh, do, do not support uh, faculty involvement in a mentoring relationship, teaching, uh, uh, unfunded research, things of that sort. Uh, so being sensitive to uh, what is the organizational culture and uh, uh, will uh, my mentor and will I uh, get support for the time, energy, we're not talking huge resources, you know, to, to do something together. It's not like a $500,000 five-year grant from the department. Maybe we're talking about, I'm making this up, you know, a, a, a seed grant uh, just to get something done or, or to uh, have assistance on a project if, if you don't have time. Uh, so uh, the... Uh, one of the obstacles uh, can be an organizational culture, uh, probably not any, again, not anything any of us would, would uh, be proud of, that just doesn't value this. Uh, and so just get the work done. You know, uh, mentoring is great, sure, on your own time, whatever. Uh, uh, anyhow, uh, uh, it's important to be uh, cognizant of what the culture will allow and, and endorse. Great, thanks. Um, it's kind of speaking along those lines as far as um, fostering mentoring relationships. Um, as kind of as a former chair, Dr. Seltzer, or maybe as a vice chair of research, which I know Dr. Kopinski and Dr. Pisano are, um, 
what what do you do at a department level to build a mentoring program? You know, do you assign mentors to people or do you encourage mentorship in general? How do you foster interdepartmental research uh, mentorship um, as a as a as a structural program? And what should leaders in each uh, academic department be thinking about when they put that together? Uh, uh, ben, Ben, I can start and. Uh... I, I, I wish I had a, a perfect answer for you, which of course I don't, uh, but I, I think it's an all of the above strategy. Uh, uh, in, in our department, at, at every new faculty member and every trainee is uh, default uh, assigned a mentor so they can get started. Uh, it's not an expectation that that's gonna be their permanent mentor, uh, but it gives both the mentor and a mentee, a sense of responsibility to one another uh, to figure out uh, if, if they can work together and if they have a shared vision of the uh, trainee or junior faculty's future. Uh, they're encouraged to make changes if that's good for them. Uh, and uh, while, you know, in a perfect world, we would give faculty uh, protected non-clinical time. I, I, I remember those days, uh, but they're gone now, <laughs> uh, to uh, help give them encouragement to provide that kind of support. Uh, that would be fabulous. Uh, so uh, our departmental philosophy has been, uh, okay, we're, we're not gonna, you know, uh, no child left behind. I shouldn't have said that, that's uh, politically charged, uh, but, uh, uh, everybody gets a mentor, uh, and if it works, great. If it doesn't work, we'll change it. Uh, but we think that uh, uh, having a mentoring relationship with someone, understanding the range of how deep that relationship can be, is a critical element of one's professional success. So uh, we're, we're going to provide it, whether you want it or not, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, and hope that over time, uh, either the assigned relationship will grow into a permanent relationship, or we'll just give uh, either the mentor or the mentee uh, insight about what would be best. And uh, if it's not working, we'll try something else. But uh, again, the default proposition is every everyone, junior faculty and uh, residence fellows, uh, need a, 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 a default mentor to, to get started. And, and then we try to refine it as it goes along. Because it's, it's, it's uh, as we were talking before, the, the activation energy of uh, a trainee reaching out to a senior faculty member is tough. Shouldn't be, but it, but it is. Uh, so our philosophy has been, we'll start you out with something. Uh, you know, if, if you have a better idea, great. And we'll, we'll try to make that happen. Yeah, we have something similar uh, for, for junior faculty where every October there's a day long event. And during that day long event, everybody who is onboarded in that previous year uh, is expected to attend and they're given time to take, you know, to take the time. And it's an introduction to all the vice chairs. It's an introduction to the chair. It's an introduction to various aspects of the university and so on. Uh, very interactive, uh, you know, some talks by HR from our diversity committee, you know, so it's, it's like I said, a day long event. And then at the end of the day, um, there's a, a mentoring uh, connection. And yeah, everybody is assigned a, a mentor. And there's about, we have a little reception, we don't this year, we ha usually have a little reception, uh, people, people can chat, wine and cheese and so on. And the key thing is that the, the assigning of the mentors is it's never well, not, I don't want to say never, but we really try not to put your division chief as your mentor. Um, it's somebody from another division. So somebody from research will get mentored by somebody in clinical. Somebody by abdominal will get mentored by somebody in chest. And, you know, so we try to mix it up. So it's not, you know, kind of, I don't want to say misconstrued, but it's not sort of that superior uh, relationship that is a superimposed upon all of this. It, it's something that's a little more independent. And again, it's the same thing. We, we like it to last a year. We say, you know, here, try this for a year, hopefully two years, maybe more. If it's really going bad, you can bail and we can find you somebody else. But we really ask them to dry, you know, at least for one year and then if not beyond. You know, uh, Elizabeth, I, I, th I think you brought up two, two very, very important points. Uh, 
uh, one is uh, mentorship for uh, women and underrepresented minorities in our department and uh, making the preliminary match. And uh, for all of us <clears throat> more senior people uh, to be uh, well-versed and uh, understanding about what kind of matches will work or not. Uh, uh, th those are uh, often among the hardest matches to make, uh, and there aren't a lot of rules of the road uh, to try to optimize those. Uh, uh, and uh, second, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, the uh, important issue of the potential conflict of interest uh, if your clinical division chief is also your mentor. Uh, we've talked about this a lot. I wish I had a perfect answer for it. But I mean, your division chief's main job is make sure there's somebody doing clinical work every day uh, and covering every seat. And uh, uh, if they have a mentee who's interested in an academic career and needs uh, protected time off or, uh, I mean, hallelujah or God forbid, uh, get some extramural grant support and say, hey, guess what? You know, I've, I got 40% extramural support. So uh, now you're gonna have to fill in my clinical time because um, funded, you name it, by GRAF or RSNA or, or uh, NIH. And the division chief, you know, has like, uh, a, a breakdown of like, oh, that's great. And oh, that's awful, you know, because now I don't, I'm not gonna be allowed to hire anybody uh, to uh, replace you, uh, but isn't it great that you got this extramural support? Uh, uh, giving a younger faculty member or a trainee, a mentor outside of this, of their division uh, mitigates to a certain extent that conflict of interest. So uh, you know, if you're a thoracic or breast radiology division chief, you're cheerleading for your faculty and you're also uh, petrified that they're gonna, gonna get a big grant and they won't be available to you. Uh, so it, I, I think you raised two very important points that uh, I, in my humble opinion, you know, we, our, our field has not uh, figured out uh, how to avoid those conflicts and uh, to provide opportunities for uh, uh, women and underrepresented minorities that are, you know, it's just not obvious about the, the, what to do. I might add that often um, the decision to leave a department and find another place to work really requires an external mentor because uh, it's hard to talk, inter it's not impossible, but it makes it challenging. If you're talking to someone in the department they may see it as part of their job to help keep you there. And it may be the best thing for you is to leave and find another venue to work. So um, I, I think that absolutely endorses the need for both external and internal. And I don't have anything to add about how to create a mentoring program. It's a very, very complicated and difficult thing to do and often fail in my opinion, <laughs> because, the per you know, because the matches don't often, you know, they seem good on paper, but they don't work out. And so I think I always, have said to people, the best mentoring programs are the ones that occur spontaneously, that people find their own mentor. They just have a connection to the person and they, you know, and they, that person is interested in helping them. There's a mutual connection. Thank you so much for those insights. Um, I want to move on to a different question. And you know, most of most the panel here and most of the audience here are faculty members at, at certain institutions and all faculty members are expected to um, to do excellent clinical work. They're expected to teach at a high level, expected to do research. They may or may not get the time to do that. But in your guys's, you know, throughout your careers, how does one balance, you know, being clinically productive, teaching at a very high level, and then performing very high level research? I'm not sure there is a, uh, a real recipe for that. Um, you know, I think you... Uh, I think what you're doing, you want to make it at a high level. Um, so you don't want to go into the clinic and miss half the cases. You don't want to write sloppy papers and you don't want to teach poorly. So I think w w whatever endeavor you're in, you have to do it with a lot of focus. And if you're doing a lot of things with a lot of focus, it's going to take a lot of time. So you're, you're not going to expect to leave at 530 or just prior to this call, I 
I was reviewing grants that were due on Friday. I mean, you just get busy and you get behind. And uh, but but I want you still want to do a good job in every endeavor that you're engaged in. Yeah, I agree with. That. I mean, I don't do clinical, but I you know I, I wear so many different hats and have so many deadlines. But yeah, I mean, it's a matter of developing your own priorities to some extent as well. Uh, learning to say no uh, when you know you're, you're looking at your schedule in advance, and you know they're asking you to review ten grants by Friday. <laughs> you know you know that you got clinical, so sometimes you have to learn to say no. It, it is hard, especially when you're starting out. Um, but also, I think you know there's just some some people that are far more organized than others. But I think everybody can figure out um, you know what. How to, how to create their own space and time. What, what I've uh, seen some people do is, you know, on the, on the days when they do have their academic days is literally put it on their calendar and block it out. Write the introduction to the paper in this two hours, you know, and don't just say research time, say, this is the task I'm going to do. And then it's gonna pop up as a reminder and you're gonna feel guilty if you just, you know, swash it away and do something else. So there, there are little, you know, I don't want to say tricks, but I mean, there, there's ways to um, try to compartmentalize and learn to prioritize. I see Edna nodding, so she does the same Yeah, thing. I do that. I always put um, specific tasks on my calendar that I plan to do, um, like review the grants or read the, write the paper or whatever it is. Um, I do that exact thing and it really helps me because <laughs> I know I have time saved for it instead of waiting, you know, trying to do it till 10 o'clock at night. The other thing I would add, I feel like I'm like the um, touchy feely person on this call. <laughs> anyway, I would just add that you should listen to your heart and figure out what you like to do best and say yes to that. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, if you're finding preparing lectures and going traveling to give talks that are basically educational talks, not as fulfilling to you, you should pay attention to that and, and say no to those things. So I did that early in my career. I was getting asked all the time. Like I was like, you know, right out early faculty. Some of my mentors thought it was a good idea for me to give talks at national meetings, basically educational talks. And I just learned that that did not make me very happy. <laughs> that the part of my job that made me the happiest, you know, you know, I, I had to do it all. You know, everybody has to do a little bit of everything, but I just didn't need to say yes to that because it wasn't making me my heart thing, you know, what was making me happiest was writing grants and doing research. So on top of the clinical work, that was where I focused my energies. Um, and uh, it made me just a happier person. It, it, it helped me not to burn out, uh, not spending those time on the road giving educational lectures. So that's just an example from my own career. Oh, and I agree 100% with if, if it's not something you enjoy, if, it's, if you're not having fun, then you really got to think about why you're doing it. That's great. That's great. Um, I just want a reminder to the guests that you're free to raise your hand. I know some people join late, so you can either raise your hand in the chat box in the um, attendee box and, and we'll call on you and you can ask a question or you can type questions in the question and answer tab. So please feel free to do that. Um, but uh, with no questions, I'm just going to move on to the next one we have prepared. Um, then if I may ask a question. Absolutely. Please yeah, do. Sure. So, I mean, this is the best panel that I can ask this question to, uh, because amongst you, you probably have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of mentees, many of whom are already successful. So, you know, how do you address the challenges of mentees from, you know, different groups? You know, you might have second year radiology resident who is interested, but has no idea what to do, just, you know, just has enough of um, affinity towards doing research. And then you might have a freshly minted junior faculty, and then you probably have, you know, mid-career faculties who have probably a bit more focus, but are perhaps looking for a sponsorship rather than just mentorship. So how do you address the challenges of you know, having mentees from different grades? Uh, I've never oh. really seen it as a challenge. <laughs> I, I enjoy it when, you know, figuring out what each person needs and, and what the goals are. So, you know, I think the real challenge is when you've got too many, at, you know, at the same time and you can't devote enough of your energy to them, but I've never really had a challenge with those those different trying to juggle different uh, mentees at different stages at the same time. Yeah, so I, I guess you know what I'm trying to say was, would you try? You know, would you think sometimes as as the mentor, you would probably perhaps create a multidisciplinary team approach to that, uh, especially if some of your mentees have you know um, ideas which are aligned. Uh, do you think it's perhaps best to combine the mentees into a single group rather than having a single assigned task for each different mentee? 
uh, because sometimes you know, it just becomes very difficult when you have mm. different groups of you know, mentees who have similar ideas, but you know, might have somewhat different thought process, but bringing them together into a research work group, uh, does that give you more success? I think it depends on the group, the task and everything else. Yeah, I've never really thought of that as a mentoring exercise. I think of that more as a project management. You know, you're trying to help finish a project. You bring together a multidisciplinary group. I've never done that with mentoring. I'm not saying it's not possible, but um, I feel like it's such a personal relationship. Often there are things you just need to say to a person face-to-face. -face. And sometimes, you know, it, it's not something you want to say in front of a group of people. But doing projects, I, I love multidisciplinary teams for projects. All right, great. Um, one other question we had uh, here is, um, do you provide any specific materials to mentees regularly? For instance, do you have a must read articles or maybe a book or, or guidance on how to be an academic radiologist, those types of things? Is there anything specific that you, you find yourself using as kind of a go-to resource for mentees? Or, or obviously the most important thing is the support and the personal relationship and experience. But sometimes, you know, um, articles and other things can be tools that may be helpful. So I was just wondering if anybody has any um, advice in that realm. Uh, I have a store of stuff, and, and some of it I've gotten from our formal program, the one that I was mentioning before. Um, but I don't, you know, I mean, it's, I, I don't like to start out a relationship with homework. So it, it's really only if, you know, if, if you sort of see a need for it, you know, I, I have a store of stuff that I can refer to, but I, I don't like to, you know, sit there and, you know, kind of force people to understand what mentoring is all about. You know, I just kind of let it flow and see what happens. And then if necessary, eh, here's an article you might find of interest. Uh, ben, ben, I was going to uh, just try a variation on that theme. Uh, I, I agree with Elizabeth uh, that, uh, uh, you know, most uh mature men mentor mentee relationships are go with the flow uh, in early stages uh, one could adopt a uh, you know in some cases with success uh, a very if you will pedagogical uh, approach and say uh, all right uh, you you want to be my mentee and I'm uh, just talking about me you know I, I've had 20 years of experience in leadership and management and uh, you didn't get taught that in residency or fellowship. Uh, and I've got a bit of a syllabus for you, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> I, I don't call it that, but uh, uh, you know, here, here are some, some uh, in addition, but most important are your, your own questions and your own objectives. But if, if we're going to be uh, talking on a regular basis, uh, uh, rather than keeping the agenda completely open all the time, uh, uh, hey, hey, why don't we, you know, next time we meet, well, I'll, I'll make this up. Uh, let's discuss uh, uh, good to great by, by uh, uh, Dr. Collins. And uh, that's something that, you know, uh, helped me in, in my leadership maturation. So, uh, you know, please do read that. And if anything else comes up that's more important for you, uh, well, that'll take priority. But uh, just so that, you know, we, we don't start lagging. This is, I, I think, again, good pedagogy. Uh, uh, so that so our mentees don't say, I got nothing for you this, this week or this month or this year. Uh, uh, th th there's, you know, uh, a sharing of uh, resources and shared knowledge that uh, the mentor can put out there uh, in, in a soft way. Uh, you know, not like being a, a junior high school teacher was saying like, read this and send me a report <laughs> three days before we meet. I'm not sure that really helps uh, at this uh, level of development, but saying, you know, hey, hey I, I, I got stuff that, that can help you. And uh, if nothing else comes up, uh, you know, please read this, do that. And uh, we'll make that the focus of our next meeting. Uh, but if something else has come up for you, that's fine. So uh, I, I like the kind of hybrid approach, uh, Ben, of saying, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're gonna be the teacher, uh, 
uh, you have to have material uh, to bring to the syllabus. Uh, but if it's a mentoring relationship, that's necessary but not sufficient. So uh, I, I personally, I, I try to do both uh, to mostly be available to my mentee for whatever they need. Uh, but if not, you know, uh, hey, we've got a, you know, in a perfect world, a, a year long curriculum of things that can add to your skills and uh, your perspectives uh, that, that I have found and I have my, in my uh, uh, online library that I'd love to talk with you about. Uh, and if it's presented in a way that, oh, I'd love to hear your perspective because I can learn from you. Uh, how cool is that? You know, because you may have a, a, a different take on uh, what my generation had on these uh, comments. So, uh, so I, I, I think ha having uh, teaching and learning resources in hand is fabulous if you can. Uh, and there are some resource libraries out there that are not hard to access. Uh, not, again, not, not necessarily the be all and end all, but I, I do think it uh, helps everybody if uh, uh, there are learning resources that are part of the relationship. The only thing I, I just have a couple things to add. I have um, I have given out books and and things over the years uh, when I think it's useful. Um, I have I actually maintained a library for the entire University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Women's Group at one point for when I was when I was there. Uh, I was there for about 21 years, and uh, I kept a library for people to come borrow from on being a woman in the workplace and particularly women in medicine. So there's a book that I really love, uh, it, which is old, but it's still very timely. It's called Play Like a Man, Win Like a Woman, which is a really great book by Gail Evans, uh, which talks about just how to, how to be a woman in the workplace. I mean, she was the first woman executive at CNN um, and worked directly for with Ted Turner. And so um, that was a very uh, male dominated profession at the time. And she really has a lot of insights into that. So I really love that book and I did give it out quite a bit. Um, the other thing I would recommend for some people if it's relevant is a 360 um, as, a, as a tool to help the relationship, which is basically you can pay for tools, you know, kind of a survey of the people around the person who you're mentoring, but you also could just do a 360. If you're, you know, if you're in the department, you could go around with the permission of the person to find out what people believe about the person and what what things they could work on what things they do well um, i've done in both things i've used a formal instrument that allows people to anonymously tell you information about the person that with the consent of the person of course and then i've also done the other where you go around and just with you know tell them i'm mentoring this person you know what do you think can you tell me your candid appraisal of the person what should i be working on with them so they can perform better you know, what do they do great so I can give them some good feedback. Um, I found that to be very useful, um, again, with the permission of the person who you're helping. You don't want to do that without their permission. Um, you also want to do it in enough time, after enough time. You can't do it like within the first six months of somebody coming to a new institution, forget about it. Um, you know, so it's got to be, I would say, at least give a, a year of somebody at a new position before you go asking those questions, because it just takes so long to get adapted and you know, people's opinions are going to change as that that person kind of gets more used to their new role. All right, thank you so much, guys. Um, I just want to have time for one more question since our time is running out. Maybe we'll end with this last final question. And the question is: So we all know that the mentor-mentee relationship is a two-way street. It, it, you know, it requires cooperation and participation from both the mentor and the mentee. And often, we all talk about the mentee driving the relationship. But I want to kind of flip gears a little bit and talk more about the mentor and specifically. What can a mentor, because the relationship becomes very close at, at, at hopefully at a certain point, but what can the mentor do to motivate the mentee? To uh, uh, Omar, just uh, uh, to kind of to re reiterate uh, what uh, a theme we were talking about before, uh, uh, and this doesn't work for everyone, uh, but uh, I have had a lot of success with this uh, idea of a compact between the mentor and the mentee. Uh, here's what I'm going to give. Here's what you're, you're going to give. Uh, and 
just to drive it down to the next level of detail, he, here are the deliverables. Uh, here's what I expect from you from at a certain date. Uh, here's what I'm going to give in terms of my time and attention. And uh, uh, to present it, it you know, not in a confrontational or uh, teacher student uh, way, but you know, th this is the way we're going to help each other uh, because it's a, a mutually beneficial relationship. Uh, but look, uh, uh, I'll, I'll present it and say, uh, do you agree with this? Uh, do, do you want to modify it? Uh, am I missing something? Uh, is the timing wrong? Uh, but if not, you know, let, let's uh, shake on it, if, if you will. Uh, and we can't shake hands anymore. I, I know it's sad, <laughs> terribly sad. Uh, uh, we'll bump elbows uh, on this and say, uh, you know, we, we agree on this as uh, uh, our, our uh, mutual commitments. And uh, in a perfect world, uh, the, the mentee drives the mentor crazy. Uh, by, by saying, hey, I want to talk with you like, you know, every 10 minutes because, uh, oh, oh my God, I just, uh, you know, uh, missed a uh, hiatal hernia on a CT scan and I, I'm, I'm upset. Uh, I, I, obviously, I'm exaggerating. Uh, but uh, if the mentee can drive, that, that's great. Uh, but my experience is that that's the exception to the rule because we've got a power hierarchy and uh, it's hard for junior faculty or trainees to uh, challenge a senior faculty member and say, hey, I'm, I'm not getting enough from you in this relationship. So uh, to the extent that that conversation can happen early uh, in, in the relationship and have a shared uh, understanding of who's committing to what, uh, in, in my experience, that, that helps. Uh, so there are not... Uh, uh, disappointments of, oh, I thought you would do this for me, but, oh, well, we, we never talked about that. And actually, I can't, you know. Uh, the, the more that can be done up front, the better. Uh, and uh, the, the more it's a, sh a shared understanding, the better. I would say to, to celebrate successes. Uh, you know, a paper gets submitted successfully or, or you submit I the grant. It. You may not get it, but I mean, you submit it you know, again, let, let's, you know, let's do a little, get a call, you know, here's a cup of coffee, whatever. Um, but kind of, you know, it, it, it's the, just the, you know, the typical kind of reward system, but not, you know, not like every single thing they do, you know, pat them on the head, but I mean, you know, meaningful uh, points in time where it, it's just good to say, hey, this worked, let's, let's, you know, celebrate ourselves. And potentially to uh, moderate the disappointment because, uh, the first time you submit the paper, it, it probably won't be received too favorably, but just to, to acquaint the mentee with the process that it's a matter of addressing a few problems and trying hard and finding the right journal and making a few modifications and maybe the, the resubmission will be, will be received more favorably. That you're not always going to get, quote, a victory, but um, as long as you're focused in the right direction and being attentive, usually you'll, you'll have forward progress. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much. I, I do want to end it here just uh, to be respectful for everyone's time. I know we said it was four to five and it's, it's, it's about to be 4.59 right now. So um, I first and foremost want to thank the entire panel. They were very generous in their not only giving their time, but also their expertise and, 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 and the whole relationship. Thank, uh, my, my, mod, my, my co moderator, Ben, for doing a fantastic job. I want to thank Duction for being an amazing RRA president for us this year. And of course, last but certainly not least, I want to thank the, uh, the RSNA and the AUR staff for you know, making sure that this was you know, done very smoothly. Thank you so much for that. And, uh, and thank you for tuning in. This will be recorded on the AUR uh, YouTube channel. So you know, feel free to take a look at this in the future if you want to you know, kind of revisit these pearls, so to speak. Uh, and for anyone else who missed this, uh, you'll, you'll be able to, you will be, uh, hear this as well. So, so thank you again so much and, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks so much, appreciate it, thank you. Yes, thank you all. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye everyone.